Hey everybody, this is John Fowler from Blaze Ventures. I'm here with Mike Gulkin on the uh, second toke, I think. I don't know, we're doing something. Have a listen. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the second episode of uh, The Joint, a podcast, a simulcast, a vlogcast, a show that is brought to you by myself, uh, Mike Elkin, also known as Canna Broker, and uh, Matteo Roxandic, uh, up in the rafters, who is my collaborator, he is my co-creator, he is on the ones and twos who's going to be helping me through the run of this show, uh, bringing you some amazing content, some amazing creative, uh, and really I wouldn't be anywhere without him. So I really want to extend a huge welcome to not only Matteo, but everybody who's watching, who's listening, um, and I, I think we're in for a big uh, for a big treat here. Hey, Matteo, how's it going? Good, good. How's it going, Mike? What an intro. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to take a, a couple of minutes um, and, and address the fact that we had, um, we had put this podcast idea together uh, to be launched with one of my clients who's a rather um, large Ontario retailer. Um, and it, it just wasn't meant to be uh, based off of some of the regulations that um, the, the provincial government has put in place in the province of Ontario, uh, some of the regulations that Health Canada has put on a, uh, on a federally regulated um, program. Uh, needless to say, um, uh, it was a valid attempt uh, to bring uncensored content um, with, a, with a major sponsor in, in a space that really wouldn't allow it. Um, we're going to put all that aside. Um, and we're going to press on because w what, what I want to do is to be able to give some people that are watching, some people that are listening, access to some of the amazing products that are being brought to you on a retail level, uh, on a medical level, um, and brought to you by the people that are, are putting those products in stores uh, and online for you, the consumer, to, um, to purchase. So with that being said, um, again, uh, a warm welcome to everybody to um, the show uh, that is called The Joint uh, I am Mike Elkin. He is Matteo uh, Roxandic. Um, and what we're going to try and do here is open up with a couple of different segments. Um, we're going to try and find some innovative ways to um, talk about current topics. We're going to talk about um, some trends that are coming up. And I think at the end of the day, we're going to talk about some of the things that I like, some of the things that Matteo likes, and some of the things that our, our guests um, like to talk about. Um, and first up tonight, uh, we're going to be bringing on um, a CEO, a trailblazer. But before that, I wanted to get into a... Um, a segment that we're going to call uh, 710 Topics. Uh, we found a couple of sort of innovative, catchy titles uh, for some of our segments. And what we're going to do in the, in the, in the initial uh, offerings um, is this sort of 7 to 10 topics that I found interesting over the last couple of weeks uh, and bring them to you. Um, so some of the stuff that we're talking about right now, one of them is um, the fact that a couple of weeks ago, the Ontario Cannabis uh, Store, the OCS, um, held a webinar where they were speaking directly to producers, to processors, to cultivators, to manufacturers, um, you know, some of the over 500 LPs, uh, license holders that there are out there, and explained to them that they, they've run into a position where uh, there's a certain amount of SKUs, and it's upwards of 200 that are... are are just not moving. Uh, and what does that mean for, for not only those um, LPs that are producing those SKUs, but really what does it mean for, for retailers and what does it mean for um, um, consumers? And, and really, um, the move, as reported by David uh, George Kosh uh, from uh, b and Bloomberg, is that the move is likely to cause further write-downs for cannabis companies that can't meet sales targets, um, exasperating an extensive inventory problem. Uh, just today, it was released that there's 220,000 kilos of, of inventory. And again, I, I even tweeted that I'm not great at math, but could that be somewhere over 200 million grams? Um, needless to say, that's a, that's a lot of weed. Um, and really, uh, for Ontario, which has roughly, I don't want to screw this number up, but three or 400 stores with a, a, over 1,000 to come in the next year, um, they just can't hold that inventory. So uh, really, uh, you're going to see some, some stuff pulled off the shelves and, and LPs that are going to suffer. Um, we are both Matteo and myself want to also um, 
talk about some of the lockdowns that are happening in the province of Ontario, some of the lockdown measures that are happening in uh, the province that I'm based in, which is Quebec. Um, so really understand that if you're going to be picking up cannabis uh, in the province of Ontario, which is only uh, click and collect and curbside um, pickup along with delivery, it's important to visit your favorite um, Ontario dispensary store's uh, website, order online, click and collect at the curb, order delivery, but really make sure that uh, you tip uh, and be grateful for those people that are delivering the cannabis to you. Um, n it's amazing that never before has it been more easy to get cannabis from, from the store to your door. Um, and, and that's a big testament to the people that are on the front lines. And I consider these people that are in the, in the storefronts essential workers. So, you know, big shout out to those people. Um, I want to make a mention to uh, Rubicon who is now available in the province of Quebec. It's a huge milestone for uh, the SQDC, which I believe only has 19 uh, LPs that currently stock those shelves. So uh, for something like the 20 to 25 stores, again, I, I got to check that number, but um, it's amazing to see some, some top tier flower come into that space. Um, I, I know as a fellow Quebecer, I've been, we've been suffering in terms of uh, quality of cannabis. So big shout out to Rubicon and Jesse and the guys over there who are doing it right. Nice to see uh, some quality flower coming into La Belle Province. Um, again, another big shout out to Oxley. Uh, they launched, uh, not launched, they released that PR that came out last week, uh, or it might have even been this, this Monday. Um, to touch on, on, on that, that company achieved uh, the number one market share for position for Cannabis 2.0 products in 2020, as confirmed by Headset, which is another data aggregator based out of the U.S., um, which means, you know, how that breaks down. Oxley had a 19.2 share of total vape market, 12% share of total edibles market, um, propelled the company to the number one overall spot for 2.0 sales for the year. So again, big shout out to Nick and Nolan and Hugo and Vlad and Mike and all the guys over at Oxley. Um, again, huge milestone. Um, some of the other stuff that came out, I believe uh, the governor uh, Cuomo announced uh, that the state of New York will be legalizing in the coming months. Uh, so that's another um, another big sort of um, market share opportunity that's going to be coming online. Great to see that. Uh, also, just, um, you know, this 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 show will air on Friday uh, and we are Wednesday today, which is the inauguration of the 46th president of the United States, Joseph Biden, Jr., uh, and, you know, really excited to see what the new administra administration is going to bring for the legalization of cannabis on a federal scale for the um, for the for the United States. Uh, a lot of people have some um, some some huge hopes for that. Uh, I being one of them, I know I have a few clients that are expanding out into the U.S. Uh, so, again, excited to see what the first hundred days look like uh, and the first couple of years as we get ready for, fingers crossed, American federal legalization. Um, another one of my clients I wanted to touch on, One Leaf, uh, based out of Saskatchewan. You can get ready to look for those products uh, listing with the OCS. We have, fingers crossed, um, by the end of February, uh, that one, the One Leaf SKUs, uh, dried flower and pre-roll will be on the buy sheets. So keep your eyes out for that. I know Trevor and the guys have produced some unbelievable flower. Uh, they, their punch is going to be amazing. They have an orange cookies coming out. That's fire. And if you haven't tried their pre-rolls, They've been doing um, whole flower pre-rolls with Keef uh, into the uh, actual pre-rolls. So again, amazing, amazing offerings coming out of One Leaf. And that's sort of uh, to touch on some uh, current topics that we've, or that we've, that I've noticed over the last couple of weeks. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on some of the segments that we're doing. Again, this is, the, there's no format for this show. It's really going to be off the cuff. The idea is to keep this 710 topics. The idea is to go into a, uh, an interview with a guest that I, I seem to think is interesting for the viewers. We're going to keep it extremely diverse. I'd like the idea of going uh, male, female, throwing in um, a bunch of different people onto the podcast. I think a lot of creativity can come out of mayhem, and I'm planning on giving Mateo a lot of, uh, a lot of shit to sift through. So... Uh, if you if you know anything about me, you know I like to go off on a lot of tangents. But at the end of the day, it's really to bring it home to to the viewers, and I want to entertain you, and I want to bring value, and that's sort of what we're going to do here. Mateo, if you want to add anything, um, add anything. If not, uh, we'll see where we go with this first episode, uh, and we'll bring on our first guest. 
So without further ado, I want to make an intro to the first ever guest on the second ever episode of the first ever episode. Um, again, I brought this gentleman back um, to reshoot this show because not only is his message extremely important, but I've known um, this guy uh, for uh, arguably about the last seven, eight years. And I, I met him at the first ever uh, cannabis trade show that I did, which was in the dungeons of the Metro Convention Center in downtown Toronto. Uh, and if I remember it well, there was might have been all of 10 or 15 exhibitors. I remember distinctly that there was this giant black curtain that uh, cut the... Uh, the basement trade show convention floor into about four or eight. And I remember the entire cannabis uh, attendees, along with the trade show speakers, exhibitors, were off into the corner. And we got strict rules to, A, not smoke inside the building, and to, two, kind of stay away from the bankers and accountants that might have been occupying uh, the same space. Um, but I, I got my first introduction to John Fowler at that trade show. And I, I remember seeing this gentleman who had... Um, other people around him while he was talking. And as someone who was new to the space and understood that you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with, that I wanted to attach myself to uh, not only him, but understand exactly what he was doing. And I remember, um, I remember uh, meeting John Fowler and I explained to him what I had done with a couple of other companies in the space and explained to him that uh, not only would I, would I die for his company, but... Um, I would be uh, relentless in the pursuit of adding value to what he was trying to do up in a seven-acre greenhouse uh, in Kincardin. Um, and I think it was from that moment, uh, we might have even signed a contract on the back of a brochure that I had been uh, handing out at the trade show about why it was important to have a good uh, security company design your cannabis um, security system. So um, from, from that inception, that meeting of John Fowler, watching him grow over the last uh, 70 years in the space, uh, from CEO of uh, Supreme uh, Pharmaceuticals and Seven Acres to... Uh, to CEO of Blaze Ventures with arguably a launch of one of the more disruptive uh, SKUs in the space in Ontario over the last couple of weeks, which are the live rosin coins. Uh, Mr. Mario himself, <laughs> the master <laughs> of the coins. John Fowler, welcome to the joint. Thanks, Mike. Happy to, to be here again, again, I guess. Again, uh, but, again, uh, again. If we excited. don't... Excited. We got, we got no rules, no holds barred, and uh, we're going to have a good chat. We're going to talk lots of weed. We're going to talk uh, maybe some interesting stories about some celebrities that you smoked with. Um, you know, what I'd love to do is um, maybe work our way back uh, like we did in, in the first conversation is kind of understand how do you end up launching a product like a live resin coin, which um, really doesn't exist uh, in the province of Ontario, arguably in, in the country of Canada, understanding that you're going to have to educate uh, a new round of of, of of clients, of consumers, of customers, um, and where does the where does the inspiration come to do something like that? Um, so there, there's a couple things there for me. Um, before we decided specifically to make those coins, what we wanted to do is, is two things: we wanted to make a product that we, as a team, wanted to consume that could be our daily driver, um, and two, we wanted to see if you could still organically create buzz in the space, right? You know, we, we were able to do that successfully at seven acres, but obviously had a much bigger engine behind us. Um, so we sat down, it was just three of us to start. We brought in some others and really what I started telling the team, it was only a six month project. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of from first handshake with our partners at AgriFarm to SOPs equipment and basically a sellout at Christmas time was about six months. Uh, but I said two things, I said, number one, uh, my fiance's name is Zoe. She is the most picky cannabis customer I've met in my entire life. I was like, she has to like it. And number two, I said, this cannot be a New England Patriots Super Bowl. And what I mean is there cannot be an asterisk beside our win. And that was my problem in the cannabis space is there's a lot of wins, but there's a whole lot of asterisks, right? Too expensive, old genetics, this, that, and the other. So we sat down, we decided to make a, an outdoor based live rosin. Uh, the coin tech is not new, actually. Hasho, our, our artist, uh, he's been doing that for a while. Others in the U.S. have done it. It gave us something unique, and it allowed us to put together something that is cheaper than the live rosin I can buy uh, from the unlicensed market. And, and for me, that's the win-win. And the coolest thing over the last 30 days since we launched, um, 
probably 70, 80 percent of my lung share has been retail purchase rosin, and that has not happened in this house uh, since the advent of legalization. So you alluded to um, and, and glossed over it a little bit that uh, you are obviously recently engaged. So uh, a huge congratulations to to that. I know it was uh, last week that we had seen a bunch of stuff on social media. Um, so maybe talk about you know what does Zoe bring to the to the table? You know every every woman in, in my life, from my wife down to my two baby girls, um, are my CEO, my CFO. They are my, uh, my conscience. So, you know, and I think you've been with her longer than a decade. So what does that mean for you to have somebody that you can rely on? Not only, I mean, essentially what you're saying is the ethos behind the coin and the launch of the coin was Zoe. Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, we've been together 13 years, uh, this coming 420, our, our anniversary, the, our first date was at a weed party. Um, so, you know, we've been legit for that long, but, um, really she's always like, she loves cannabis and for her cannabis isn't business. So she was always that voice in the back of my head, really the champion for the consumer at home. And there was nothing more deflating when I do things for myself or for clients. And I'd, I'd be so excited cause I'd be wrapped up in the business and she'd have one polite puff eh, and then go back to smoking whenever she was smoking or like, I would used to get so angry. Um, but this was how, what we were able to do with the live rosin and, uh, we got a couple other branded plays in the works, and really, it's that mindset. They're not all products for Zoe per se, but that idea of um, we can't just turn our mindset to there's a customer that we just can't get. We have to get all of the the heady consumers, all of the real, you know, hardcore stoners that love cannabis. And you know, look, a lot of them have really attractive price points, and we got to figure out how to provide uh, a better total value experience. Um, if we want their business over time. And I, and I think you, you alluded to that right now. And what it really boils down to is education of the consumer, of, of the client. Now, like, how are you doing that when we're talking about lockdowns in Ontario, when we're talking about it's click and collect, there's no product knowledge sessions, there's no people walking in the stores. So where you've had a client who spends, let's say, two minutes, three minutes inside a store and you can grab their attention and push a product. I've said this to numer numerous clients retail clients that I have, you've gone from that attention span to something that's 11 to 17 seconds, that someone's rolling up to a curb, running into a store. So what have you done? What has, what has you know, um, We Are Big done to sell out essentially over Christmas time? Uh, so for us, it's all about, you know, I, I think there's a three-legged stool to make great products in cannabis. First of all, the product itself has to be great for whatever consumer you're going at. So for us, that's working with AgriFarm. They grew the flower, uh, hash and and Agri -Farm together in the SOP. Shout out to Peter Miller, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big shout out to, to the whole team there. Yeah. Uh, you know, Miller, Miller gets to be the, the pretty face behind it, but there's a team of hardworking. Uh, Tracy's the master grower there and, and a bunch of ladies and men that, that I mean, work in a field is, that's real farming, like legit black, back breaking, you know, bending over farming kind of stuff, yeah. right? Um, but they, they worked all year to grow the beautiful flower that went into our critical lemon. And then we took our time extracting it. We do it all by hand. We throw away some of the, the lower quality product, which takes our yield down. Uh, we actually had about another 10% that just wasn't stored right. We decided not to sell that. So you start with a great product. The second piece is when through our commercial strategy, we were able to, to lever our relationships and work with the OCS and now with some other provinces to get a fair price point. Uh, really pushing on the fact that we wanted to have an MSRP that was below, uh, pretty much below the wholesale price of of good rosin in, in the unlicensed market. Like we didn't just want to meet retail. We wanted to come way, way under. And then the third piece is uh, have an organic marketing. So if you saw, you know, Scott Walters, who's my partner, Agri Consult, he was just blogging his day yeah. and, and the guy's excited and the, he's got his own selfie stick. He's got like the longest arms you've ever seen. Yeah. So he gets great angles. Uh, best and, selfie. And we just did it organically, right? Oh, so good. That man shoots a uh, selfie. But you know, in we just did seconds. it organically, right? right. And, and that's what I love. The entire budget on the marketing side was like under two grand. We, we spent a couple bucks on a logo and the rest of that we did it. Uh, actually, Scott's son, Max, does most of our, our creative and, and he's just in school. So he's learning and helping out in the family, uh, you know, drug selling business basically. And, you know, it's, it's fun, right? And it, it's great because you wake up every morning excited to collab. I get WhatsApp messages in the middle of the night. How about this? How about that? And it was just super organic. And then once we got into stores, it's just feeling the love and that feedback loop of retailers and having them reach out. Um, and it's been good. And actually, to be honest, COVID has made uh, the way we sell better. And there's sure. a lot of things that we changed because of COVID that we will keep as our normal 
um, even when the door is open and people are back in the stores. So understanding, and I have that mentality too, the people that succeed in these times are, are, are not only real operators, but understand that we will be facing easier times. So make, uh, I don't know what this, screw up a saying but yeah be able to succeed in, in oh your through your greatest struggles become your greatest successes so understanding like how do you stay above water in this um so th- this is a good transition to some of the points that i brought up in a, in a segment that we started at the beginning of the show which is seven to ten topics um you know i think it was last week or the week before the ocs held a webinar uh with producers where they're explaining that they're delisting SKUs. Um, and I, I believe they had, you know, hit on the concentrate market and they hit on, on vapes. Uh, so does that change anything you guys are planning on doing in the next six months for your next drop? Can you tell us a little bit about what's coming out? What's, what's the next like three to six months heading into summer going to be like for you guys? No, no change. So whether that's for, for big or, or Muskoka grown where I'm an owner or some of the other brands we work with, look, the SKUs that get delisted are the SKUs that don't sell. So don't get it twisted and and make it sound like OCS is the big bad guy. A bunch of people put a bunch of garbage product to market at way too high prices, and they're crying a river for the fact nobody's buying it. Well, there's no right, there's no obligation for someone to buy my weed just because I grew it right. and put it in the package. So that is 100% on the brands, in my opinion. Um, so for us, actually, this, this plays in our favor. Now, real category management is in place. Now you have to understand your consumer. You have to understand the value chain and how to... How does the brand interact with the OCS, with the retailer, with the end consumer? It's a product, like from a brand perspective, we got to sell it three times. We got to get the OCS to take it. Then you got to get the retailer retailer to buy it. Then we got to get a consumer to buy it. And as you always remind me, then we got to get that guy to turn around in the door and come back and do it again. Um, So for me, nothing's changed. We we never aspire to to produce a low volume product. Um, But I think what it's going to require the industry to do is it's no longer good enough to just be there. Right. Right. You got to actually be good. And I think the silver lining, again, you know, through that hardship, generally you, you learn and evolve. There's going to be a lot of pain in the short term because there's going to be a lot of write downs, but those write downs or returns were coming anyways. But now companies are going to have to sit around their boardroom table and say, who are we in business to delight? What is this or who is this brand for? Why is somebody going to give me their hard earned dollars versus somebody else, especially in the 2021 where those hard earned dollars might be harder to come by than they were in 2020 or 2019. So um, all in, you know, this is something everybody should have seen coming. Uh, we're certainly there to help clients with strategies. We build our own brands to, to work for this. And it should come in other provinces as well, because, you know, I, I feel bad for people that have spent time building a business with no real commercial plan. And, and they're putting up their hands saying, well, who's going to buy my stuff? Yeah. Well, you should have asked yourself that question before you put first shovel in the ground. Uh, or grew your first plant. Yeah, and I think that touches on the stat that was released today, I believe, which was over 220,000 kilos um, over, over oversupply from the October uh, crops. Um, and I, I mentioned that in the opening segment. My math ain't that good, but I think that's like over 200 million grams. So again, um, never more is it is it important to speak to your to your customer and understand uh, the relationship. Uh, I know from a personal perspective, from a business perspective, some of the stuff that I'm doing with retailers and brands um, is is trying to figure out how are we um, speaking to clients that either uh, a aren't listening or don't have their focus put on you on your brand, and um, it's extremely important um, in this. Um, so that's great. So you guys have new stuff coming out. You have more coins that are going to be dropping over the next um, couple of... We've got our, our second flavor should be in store by the end of January. Uh, it's coming soon. Uh, that's a really exciting one. We're, we're holding back the name for now, but um, we work with a regenerative farmer. So this is like uh, uh, basically all the animals work together to grow beautiful soil and, and just made some beautiful cannabis. Um uh, through a micro license. So it's super craft. Mm. Uh, it was a custom blend. So if you think of like a uh, crew champagne or something where, where the blend master puts it together to get the flavor bang on that was Hasho in the lab, trying different bubbles to, to get it together. We're super proud of it. Uh, a lot of our Instagram, the super yellow, really light looking rosin. Uh, that was that one that'll be there. And then uh, following on probably end of February, we've got one that I'm super impressed or super excited by. Um, I can't say who it is yet because uh, we're still working on it, but I get to produce rosin with my team from two people who are legitimately some of my top Canadian cannabis heroes, like people that I got into the space because of these guys. And just through a way a few things worked out, um, I was able to get myself a whole hell of a lot of fresh frozen. 
and uh, we're going to put some really, really exciting points to market for the spring. And I put two and two together. <laughs> Maybe I did. Maybe I did. Um, okay, so that's great. Listen, we're, everybody's and obviously uh, more uh, provincial rollouts. Alberta, Saskatchewan, BC coming or not in yep, the talks we'll right be, now. We'll be mostly coast to coast over the next few months. So uh, we're banging our heads a little bit in BC and for, like this is category management, right? Mm. So uh, BC has a lot of concentrates. Unfortunately, I think a lot of mismatch value price concentrate. Uh, so we're not out there this, just yet. But I've been super thankful for a wave of retailers that have reached out on our behalf saying they want our product. So I think we'll get it there soon. And uh, we should be in the other provinces shortly. But, you know, look, this is this is the future, right? This is cannabis is a margin business. You got to really delight people. I think if we do a great job at our price point, we'll have the we'll have the uh, luxury afforded to us or the privilege of playing around with some higher end product mm -hmm. and, and some more expensive input flour. Uh, and I think that's the right way to look at it, whether you're in concentrates or whether you're in flour like just start with the baseline, do a great job, work fucking hard. And then, uh, you know, if you do well, you'll have those opportunities to, to, to bite up the food chain a bit. 100%. And that's some of the most successful brands in California. That's what they've done. You know, there's tons of um, comparisons when you talk about Canada, when you talk about California. And what I like to remind people um, is that California had a little bit more of a hybrid medical program that was set up for the last 20 years. So transitioning into their retail was, was a lot easier. Um, and, I think even that's a, a good transition to some to uh, a ne another topic that I'd like to bring up. Um, I think it was like a month or two months ago. You had been doing a guest uh, bud tender um, spot at the neighborhood joint. Andrew, really another shout out um, to a great guy in the space. Uh, and you had spent a, a great deal of money on a number of different products. I think I forget what the total was, but at the end of the day, I think you had bought ten or twelve SKUs and you had found two out of the 12 that, you know, you had really found a liking to and coming from someone that's putting stuff onto shelves, not only how is that a big problem in your eyes, but how can you relate to someone that does with their hard earned money, go in and spend five or 600 bucks. And at the end of the day, essentially they're getting a hundred bucks of stuff that's actually worth the money. Yeah. So it's tough. Right. And I, I think, you know, I'm not the normal consumer and I get that. But, you know, I also walk into the store with an abnormal amount of knowledge. Like, I, I love standing behind the desk and talking to people because, I, I mean, I, people had to put up with me. I would be like, oh, that's so-and-so's brand. And I would tell them stories sure. about <laughs> whoever it was. But, you know, my, my challenge is, first and foremost, um, as it stands today, the label and the brand don't tell me enough about what to expect in the product. And, and I want to be clear, that is not a Health Canada problem. That's a company problem. So uh, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, Hugo... Uh, who actually I met for the first time at that conference you mentioned, uh, who was my lawyer for a long time, went on to run Oxley. They're crushing it in the 2.0 space I just saw. Uh, they have Robinson's Cannabis, right? So we talked about it last time. First of all, I have the greatest amount of respect for those guys because they have this weird, overdrive, super tight joint concept. Not my thing, but the first cannabis company I've seen willing to die on a hill for something they believe in. And I love that brand for that. I tried their Purple Kush. Beautiful. Old school, it was like smoking in a time machine. It took me back to like younger days when my hair was longer. And then I wanted to come home. So Zoe and I don't really drink. And uh, I wanted to get um, I wanted to get her, uh, you know, something nice on a Friday. And I went in to a Tokyo smoke store and I was going to get the PK. And they said, hey, why don't you try the lemon mm -hmm. garlic OG? So that's, you know, to me, I've had that strain a number of times. I know what to get. I take it home. Beautiful jar. Gorgeous buds. Well, well, you know, well grown, nothing wrong with them, but did not have that gassy flavor profile I would expect from that lemon garlic. So I'm sure it probably is a lemon garlic OG, but it was selected in a way that I don't have a way of knowing. That's not the gassy profile I like. Zoe sniffed it, put the lid on, and, and it's been in our drawer pretty much ever since. And, you know, that's a $50, $60 rate. Yeah. I can't remember exactly. So, again, it, it's, it's understanding that it's not just about good wheat, right? It's about getting the flavor profile that people are expecting. So I think that's number one. And then I think the second challenge around value is just um, just around age and quality. So, um, you know, again, the OCS, for example, they're putting rules around uh, how old product can be and whatever. Uh, I know people want to see harvest dates on packages. They want to see packed on dates. They want to see all this information. All of that is basically consumers trying to help themselves because brands won't help them. I know with the brands like Muskoka Grown or, or Big um, Rosin Coins, 
we know where our inventory is in Ontario. If our inventory is not sold through, we will be aggressive to move it through faster because it's not getting any better sitting in warehouse. Now, I don't have the data I, I would love at the point of sale to know exactly where it is and call you up and, and say, hey, Mike, one of your stores has some older inventory. How do I move that through? I hope that's coming. But that's on the brand. Like, you know, to me, that's not a complaint of anybody else. That's what we need to be investing in to know where our product is and make sure we're selling it at its prime. And the moment it passes prime, then we're discounting it down. And, and I said this today on a, on, a, on a call. The problem with that, in my mind, is that you have – you were in an industry in a space right now where you have Circle K, Couchard, Loblaws, Provigo, Metro, IGA, mentally everybody, all these stores in terms of like a comparison to Ontario retail are coming to market at the same time. And at the same time, you have every product that fills all those shelves and all those stores coming to the market at the same time. Right. So then mm-hmm. how uh, you have every brand that wants to partner with every retailer and do every PK session and every retailer. And what you have to understand, just in the province of Ontario, we're going to have a thousand stores by the end of the year, is you have to be able to look behind the scenes, right? And pick operators, pick bud tenders, because what we're learning, what I'm learning, what I've learned from California, what I've learned from Oregon, Washington State, Florida even, is that it's the people behind the counters and their connection to the brand that are going to be able to speak to the people in the stores. Yeah. So if the brands have no connection, and, and, so and I just want to allude to this, this one thing, some of the most successful brands in California that were launched in 2017 and 2018 understood that and they were relentless being in the dispensaries. I mean, they were, I know guys that work for Select Oil that would park outside the dispensary and wait for it to open and go spend eight, nine hours inside the dispensary and educate. And that's yeah, what we're absolutely. lacking. And I think, look, the, the problem is you're as a brand you're defined by what you don't do almost more than what you do and you know i think that we've all pandered to being a little bit of something for everybody so you know we're very open if you don't know what a rosin coin is and you don't know the tools to smoke it please don't buy it Mm. and we've said that to retailers if if someone comes in is like oh that's kind of fun like yes you can crumble it up and put it in a joint and if you really love rosin that i mean those are like the donut joint that's you know, a joint times 10,000. But for the most part, I would rather you not buy it because you're going to have a mediocre experience and save that for a dab kid who comes in who knows exactly sure. what to do with it and is going to go home and have a couple hundred dollars of tech uh, to get it done. And, and the same thing, you know, with Muskoka Grown, it's going to take us about six months before we, we unveil the brand refresh. But we're going to go into a direction with a very, you know, notable flavor profile and potency it's going to be the greatest thing in the legal market for some, and it's going to be offensive to others. Right. And that it will make me happy to know that the people who the brand is not for maybe even are offended because of how much the people the brand is for love what we're doing. So it's almost, and, uh, and I'm not trying to plan these things, but it's almost like um, Supreme. And I don't mean you're Supreme. I mean Supreme on Fairfax in California. I lived five minutes from that store and I remember I would drive up Fairfax and I think it was Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays and there would be maybe a thousand people that were in line and then would sit there and spend a thousand dollars for a, a visor cap. Um, and, and it's again that mentality of cater to your client and you have to be able to block out the noise and say that one person that's going to come in and buy that $70 rosin coin that's going to sprinkle out on a joint who's going to get a horrible experience is not the guy who's going to go home with it with a thousand dollars worth of tech that is that client that comes back in the door. So I think with, with with that, I mean, just to switch gears a little bit here, what do you what do you miss most about being in Concord and working for Supreme slash Seven Acres? Um, you know, running a, a publicly traded company. What, what do you what do you miss? Because uh, I, I know you would die. You people. died. Yeah, the people. You you died for those people. Yeah. So for me, it was like just. We, we just had, it, it was wild. We were like a company town, right? We were, we were 600, 700 people. In the hotel. In a town. By the that, lighthouse. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, there, wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot else going on up there outside of the nuclear power plant. So we, we, we just made an impact that was wild to me. And, and I love being up there because if I was gone for a week, there was physical progress. The building had changed. I, I'd see room full of room full of, of plants. And, and, you know, our goal was to prove that we could produce you know, small scale quality on a large scale. And we were definitely getting uh, down that direction. Um, And then I always loved the public company side. I just got to go tell their stories. I got to go to investment conferences and speak to investors and just tell them about the great work that six, 700 people in Concordia were doing. 
Um, so I miss that, you know, but the flip side is what I've gained now, whether I'm working with the team at Big uh, or whether I'm working with the team at Muskoka is, is small as nimble, right? Mm. So now we can do whatever we want. And the biggest thing I like is we don't have to think about what the market's going to think, right? So we don't have to worry about, is this going to be, you know, are we going to be seen as too big or too small or what's the perception? If the product is good and there, there's a dollar to be made, we hustle and we go out and get it and, and we get to do that. And then the last thing, and this is the biggest benefit, with a public company, you've got to tell everybody what you're doing, either exactly when you do it or worse, before you're doing right. it. So here the beauty is we, we launched our rosin coins and actually we had tons of buzz going. We didn't even tell anybody the brand name until after we shipped them to the OCS. Right. And it just we just proved that it didn't matter, right? Um, you know, our next drop, we're going to launch it when it launches with Muskoka Grown. We had a record quarter. We had the best quarter that that company's ever had in December. And I didn't have to put a news release, you know, patting myself on the back about it. I got to say, good work, team. Um, you know, got some Christmas gifts and then said, okay, it's January 1st. What are we doing in the next 90 days? Right. So execution, you know, and again, some of the some of the amazing stuff that you did um, while at Seven Acres. I mean, um, arguably the largest, one of the largest stars, hip hop stars, uh, culture stars uh, in Wiz Khalifa. And I think that was one of the one of the biggest, if not um, one of the more forward thinking licensing deals with KK um, and Khalifa Kush. I mean, like how 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 did you put yourself into that sort of um, scenario and how do you go um, from somebody that's such an icon in hip hop in, in California cannabis and get him up? to Amish country where taxis are horse and buggies, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, so, so it's interesting about that is actually we, we tried for a while not to do, uh, the whiz deal. So it, we knew some people, we had some connections. Um, and then basically, um, I was down in LA for some other meetings back when we were trying to see if we could possibly invest directly in California. And actually I met with in a parking lot. It's actually the photo that's kind of behind me above my head. And he was working out. He, I mean, you, you've seen him. He's a freaking GI Joe. Um, <laughs> but what was amazing is we wanted to meet him and we had to meet him at the kickboxing gym. And I, I didn't go in. I heard the sound of them kicking bags from outside and I was like, Holy crap. And he came out like clearly had been busting his ass for hours in the gym, sits down. He's a tall dude. So he kind of just unfolds himself into this Mercedes in the back seat and rolls himself a joint. And two things happened that time. One, we smoked the KK with him and it is legit fantastic weed. I want, I'm not gonna lie. I wanted to hate on it. I told him I wanted to hate on it. It was super good. One of the nicest OGs I've ever had. But the part that really stuck in my head the grower, like the guy who arranges um, the, the strain to be produced in California for Wiz was there and Wiz gave him shit. Wiz was upset that this batch that I thought was fantastic didn't have exactly what he wanted in the last batch. And I realized in that moment, this was not a guy trying to put his brand on some weed to make a little money. This was a guy who, when he got the, um, you know, the privilege that comes with the, the kind of success he's had that he's worked really hard for in his life, he didn't, he didn't say, hey, I want a bunch of Ferraris or I want a private jet. He's like, I want my perfect weed. Yeah, better I'm weed. Like, That's the coolest thing ever. And I found out later his team had to convince him to go sell it because he just made it because he wanted it for himself. He, he worked to find the perfect OG and that's what he loves. And I think, look, anyone that loves weed, there is nothing better than a great OG. That is sure. the pinnacle of the best of the best. And so that picture is actually uh, um, the first time he gave us KK. And it was the funniest thing. We were flying out the next day. Uh, so obviously we can't bring anything back with us. And he's got this huge mason jar and he's like, here, take some. I'm like, oh. That's like, I can't just take some. What if I take too much? What if I take too little? So I just put my hand out like, you know, like Oliver Twist, like, please, sir, can I have some more? And he dumped like a, easily a half ounce in my hand. And then he looked, I was traveling with someone else. He's like, do you want some? He goes, no, we're together. We're leaving tomorrow. He goes, well, you should take some. And then he gave him a handful. And then next thing you know, we're walking down the street with this, like, we're in like um, Sunset Boulevard with these two handfuls of cake. Yeah. Like, what do you do? So I ended up putting it in my pockets <laughs> and going back to the hotel. <laughs> nice. Again, um, testament to uh, relentless passion, not only from your side, but from, from Wiz Khalifa. Surround yourself with people that are 
other executors and hold the same passion that you do. Um, and for, you know, what I've found in this space is it's a lot of it is dictated by law of attraction. Um, and some of the stuff that I believe in that I've learned from being around guys like you, guys like Chuck, early uh, settlers in this space is try and be the dumbest guy in the room. Um, and, you know, when I first started this in this eight years ago, I only knew about security. I didn't really know about um, cannabis at all. And I, and I'll allude to, to one story. The first person that ever show, showed me about hash oil was you. Uh, I remember we had dinner in some random Chinese restaurant or sushi restaurant in, um, in Toronto by the airport. And you had whipped out this pen. And it was my first in sort of understanding what concentrates were. Um, cause again, I, I'm 43 years old and I was, uh, a 70s baby and grew up with shitty weed with seeds uh, that I would steal from my dad's uh, underwear drawer. Um, so yeah, you, you <laughs> learn, you educate yourself. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, again, great stories, huge success for, for we are big. Um, 2021 is going to be an amazing year for you guys. I'd love to end this uh, sort of talk with a segment that we're going to call the four by four twenty marathon. Um, it's four yeah. questions that I'm going to ask you. You'll have 20 seconds to answer. You give four answers per question. Uh, and if you get it wrong, you have to send me some swag and product uh, in the mail. And uh, if not, I can, uh, I'll pick it up in person. So with that being said, we'll jump into the first uh, 4 by 420 John, name me for your favorite strains. Uh, headband, Jack Hayes, uh, Lemon Tree, and classic OGs, the KK. There you go. John, name me four people you would love to have a session with. Uh, I'd love to have another session with Wiz. Uh, now that he's pardoned, I've always wanted to smoke with Lil Wayne and know if he sounds like that in person. <laughs> um, I'd love to smoke with Obama because you know he gets down. And I'd like to smoke with Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> And you switched up one. We can point. do it all at the same time. That's a that's a great session of everyone together. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, John, name four of your favorite places in the world. Uh, so Barcelona for me. Uh, that's the home of, of Spanibus. Uh, San Sebastian is also in Spain. That's where Dina Prem's from. I think it's the greatest city in the world. Um, for me, L.A., always near and dear to my heart, getting down there. Uh, and fucking Toronto, man. I love this place. It's where I'm from. And the more I travel, the more I love it. Agreed. I love those. Uh, and we'll, we'll end with something deep and I won't put you on the clock for this, but, um, if you could accomplish four things in your lifetime and I'm, I'm asking you to, you know, almost leave a timestamp to a legacy here. Um, what four things would you like to accomplish? Uh, I, I think first is whatever my, my business career is. I hope they write it up fondly. So, uh, when my obit comes, I hope people are lining up on who gets to write it, but you know, I, I think that's leaving leaving a stamp. Uh, for me, I got to be a part of legalization. I, I spent 10 years pre-legalization working towards that, and I got to make an impact and, and sit there on, on what this looks like. So for me, that's big. Uh, the second one is is I would love to have a brand that in the future, some kids, you know, some 19-year-old person 50 years from now is going to be Googling this great weed brand. Like, oh, who's this crazy person, John Fowler, back in 2020 uh, that got it going? Uh, the third one is I'd like to be able to leave uh, something behind for uh, charitable purposes, you know, some sort of, of philanthropy. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what it is yet, you know, I thought that social change was needed around legalization. I worked hard to help make it happen with a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of other social causes, whether that's, um, you know, the impacts of prohibition over time or even non-cannabis related, you know, homelessness, food insecurity, uh, income inequality. There's a lot of other issues that I care about. And uh, over the next few years, I, I plan to pivot more of my attention on, uh, you know, whatever the next hill we have to climb is. Nice. Good stuff. Um, yeah, again, w with that, uh, we'll, we'll wrap this first second, first second, second toke of the first episode of the first joint uh, with John Fowler. Again, thanks so much, John, for, for stopping by. Uh, big things looking for, for you guys um, and your crew in 2021. Uh, be safe. Uh, be healthy. All the best. Congratulations on your engagement again. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap up uh, this show. Um, I, again, what I want to do is try and bring added value to the people that are buying the products in the stores and the people that bring them to you. Um, I'd like to think that I could have some uh, some access to some stories uh, and some interesting people. Um, also, uh, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram. If you want to send me some swag to wear on one of the shows, I'm down. Mateo's down too for swag. 
Matei, you down for swag? Um, we're going to be airing these shows probably every second Friday. Again, stay tuned. Uh, John's episode is going to be on this Friday at 8. And then our next guest will be Kylie. Uh, I think she has to be one of the first ever female CEOs of a micro. Um, I've followed her story for quite some time. It is definitely one of um, determination, of perseverance, uh, and I think she has a lot to add. And um, again, we'll pull what we can from that. Um, all the best to everyone watching on all these platforms. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this, uh, this segment. Thanks again, guys.